first thing I'll do, uh, I suggest doing, is that I'll just talk to you for 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes, right, about the whole idea behind Dyson spheres, Dyson swarms, Dyson clouds, Dyson vacuum cleaners, all that. And after that, then, you know, you can fire questions at me. How's that? Okay. Now, all these, all these people on my screen are in their third year of college, right? <laughs> Just a bit younger. <laughs> well, we, we are all like 10 to 14 years old. Right. Well, I was that age myself back in the 19th century. Okay. Well, let me just talk at you for, for a little bit. Uh, this will put you in, a, in the mood for, you know, a nap mostly. But the idea of Dyson spheres, I mean, you've all read something about a Dyson sphere. Would you know one if you saw it tomorrow on the street, right? Could you order it from Amazon? Um, the, the idea is actually goes back at least 60 years. But in fact, it goes back farther than that because it was a science fiction author who wrote about Dyson spheres, although he didn't call them that a uh, long time before Dyson did. But the, the problem is this. If you consider how much electricity, for example, the, uh, the world burns up, you know, the, the, the rate at which we're using energy and not just electricity, I and mean, we're using, you know, a gasoline, right? And there are fuel oil heating systems and natural gas, you know, you, you burn up, each of you burns up on average 10,000 watts. That's, that's the power consumption of uh, an indiv individual living in the United States, 10,000 watts. Now that's a lot of, that's a lot of power. You know, your cell phone works on maybe a 10th of a watt. So th this is, uh, you know, a hundred thousand times more than a cell phone. It's a lot of energy. And uh, we have derived that energy ever since cavemen figured out that having a fire in their caves was a good idea, not just for cooking food, or keeping away, you know, other animals that uh, might chow down on them, but simply because, you know, with with fire you could do things like extract metals from dirt, kind of thing, and and build interesting stuff. So energy use just keeps going up and up. And for a long time, uh, the way a, a country could be measured in terms of how advanced is this country was by the per capita energy use, right? If you, you know, said the average citizen in this country is, uh, you know, consuming energy at the rate of 5,000 watts, uh, that's probably a country that's not as advanced as one that's consuming 10,000 watts per person. So energy is an important thing for society as we know it. But we've, we've been doing that by, you know, essentially burning stuff. Almost all the energy that's generated is by burning stuff gasoline in your car, right? The local power plant down the, down the street, it may be burning natural gas, it may be burning coal, but it's burning something. And in chemistry, you'll learn that, you know, burning something is just a chemical reaction. And it, it essentially all it does is sort of rearrange electrons in the outer parts of their atoms. It isn't very efficient. You can get a lot more energy by doing other things. But what Tice, Dyson and the predecessor were thinking is, well, look, how far can we go? How much energy can we ultimately get? And not energy that we get by burning stuff because, you know, that results in air pollution and global warming and all sorts of stuff. And he said, well, look, the biggest source of energy in the neighborhood is the sun, right? The sun is sort of a middle-class star. You know, there's, there, there's stars that are much bigger than the sun. There are stars that are so big, and you can see them at night here in the winter, uh, in Orion, Betelgeuse, you may have heard of its name because it's such a weird name. Betelgeuse, you know, if, if you drop that in instead of this, the uh, sun, you say, okay, the sun, it's okay, but I'm getting a little bored with it because I've been looking at it every day. Well, not if you live in a cloudy place, but, you know. Uh, what if you replace it with Betelgeuse? Betelgeuse would be so big, this, the earth would be inside of it, right? That's a big star. But we have the sun and it's nearby. It's only 93 million miles away. At least that was the, what I measured this morning. Maybe tomorrow it's a little different. But how do you get all that energy, right? The sun is putting out about four times 10 to the 26 watts. And, you know, that might be a number, the notation you don't use much. But what that mean is, means is if you wrote that number out, it would be four followed by 26 zeros. 
That's a big number. That's a lot of energy pleasure, right? Scientific notation, right, exactly. There's also unscientific notation, but we won't discuss that now. All right, so four times 10 to the 26 watts is a lot more than the Earth is used to, right? If you add up all the energy use in the world due to, you know, that humans are interested in, right? I mean, all the cars, all the trains, the planes, right? All the energy you're using that comes out of a plug in the wall, a socket in the wall. If you add it all together, how much energy? I mean, you know, the industries and so forth. So you add it all together and it's about 10 trillion watts. That's the rate of energy use by all homo sapiens. Now you could also add in the energy use of, you know, hippos and rhinos and stuff like that. And they do consume some energy because they eat stuff. But anyhow, that's still, you know, not so great compared to what humans use. So four times 10 to the 26 watts, four followed by 26 zeros, that's a big number, but it's, you know, it's going up. People are using more and more energy all the time, all right? I mean, you've got to have that, uh, you know, more powerful leaf blower for your backyard, whatever. Now, how can we get that? Well, we could burn more stuff. I mean, there's plenty of coal in the ground, right? There's enough coal in the U.S. in the ground to last for the next 400 years, which is probably longer than you're going to care about it, okay? So you could do that, uh, but, you know, it has consequences like adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and pollution and so forth. And not only that, your window sills get all black and, 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 and dirty <laughs> when, you, uh, when you burn stuff. So people are against burning stuff. I mean, they're just against burning stuff, right? I, I live in a house that has a fireplace, and I use it for you know, storing stuff like dead, dead, pets, dead pets and what else do I store in there? I don't know, you know, ballpoint pens that don't work anymore, stuff like that. But there are people who like to have a fire in the evening and burn something, you know, logs in the backyard, logs that they found in the neighbor's yard that weren't being used, whatever. But that produces pollution. So what Freeman Dyson was thinking was, well, what's the best we could do, right? I mean... Let, let's, let's forget about nuclear power. Let's forget about fusion power. Let's forget about the coal, the gas, the wood, all of that stuff. What's the best we can do? And he said, well, look, you got this star over here, 93 million miles from you know, downtown Chicago, and it's putting out four times 10 to the 26 watts. And we're only using 10 times, well, 10 to the 13 watts, more or less. All right. So the whole energy budget of the uh, world is roughly 10 trillion watts, but the sun is putting out many orders of magnitude more than that. And we don't use it because it, you know, it, it, it streams out of the sun, all the sunlight, and it just zips by the earth and it does no good to anyone here. And in fact, there's no good period, except that if you're an astronomer, you know, on some other planet somewhere, you might have the sun marked with a little dot on your star charts. That's all we get out of those 10 to the 26 watts that the sun is putting out. So Dyson said, look, here's what we do. We'll just build a big shell outside the Earth's orbit, maybe a shell that's at 100 million miles away from the sun and cover the inside with solar cells and collect all the energy coming out of the sun and somehow beam it down to Earth. And you know, energy will be so prevalent Nobody will have to uh, worry about energy anymore. Uh, you know, it won't cost anything to gas up your car because you won't be using a car that runs on gas. It'll be running on electricity, and all this electricity is coming from all these uh, solar cells on the inside of an isosphere. Now, you probably know all that, and uh, for the three of you who are not asleep yet, let me just tell you what's wrong with that, right? I mean, in a sense, it doesn't sound like there's anything wrong, but... I don't know how many of you have already taken freshman physics in, in college, probably half of you, but I'm not sure. In any case, so what you find there is that if you were to build a big spherical shell outside the Earth, whether it's covered with solar cells on the inside or not, if you were to build that, it turns out that <laughs> it would just sort of drift around. It wouldn't be held in place the way the Earth is held in place by the gravitational pull of the sun. A, a big sphere would... <laughs> Wouldn't do that, and, and you'll you'll find out why next time you take physics, All right? So it would sort of drift around, and that'd be embarrassing because eventually it would it'd drift around and smash into the earth, and somebody would get hit on the head 
by this giant Dyson sphere. But if you don't make it a complete sphere, if you just build part of it, right, or maybe break it up into parts, then it doesn't have this problem of uh, dynamics. It won't, you know, slide into the sun. It won't, you know, disappear or anything like that. So you could do it. However, could you really do it? Even aside from this problem that it can't be a sphere, it should be a Dyson swarm. There's a whole bunch of satellites all out far enough away so they don't block the sun for us, right? And then, you know, we just co cover the inside of those things and we don't have to get the entire sun's output. If we could get one ten thousandth of the sun's output, it would be more energy than we could possibly eat. It would be more energy than we could possibly use. You could, you could soup up your, your smartphone <laughs> to, to run on enough energy that you could use it also to cook your dinner, all right? So you could get a lot of energy and it sounds all perfectly free because the sun is not charging, okay? Well, yes, but there, there are a couple of engineering problems here that are not trivial. First off, you wanna build at least part of a sphere and put it in orbit outside the orbit of the earth. Now, you know, we send things into space all the time, but usually not much bigger than, you know, a Volkswagen Beetle or anything like that. I mean, that's about the, the maximum size. But you're going to put something out there that's, you know, 100 mil, well, 200 million miles across, and you want it to cover a lot of the sky. I mean, that, that's something that, you know, that's more than a weekend project. This is going to take some time. And that's really the big difficulty with the uh, Dyson sphere, because, you know, you can't build it. I mean, sounds good, but you can't build it. It's like saying, we're going to build a replica of Baltimore on Mars. I don't know why you choose Baltimore, but you might. And, you know, yeah, in principle, you could do it, but in practice, you really can't do it. Not now. And the same is true of Dyson swarms, Dyson spheres, any of those ideas. It's something for the future. Now, what do I mean by the future? Next week? No. Uh, next year? No. Next century? Maybe, possibly. Okay. So I'm not going to see it. Some of you might see it, but it is an interesting idea because what Dyson has done is something that's really kind of nifty. He said, look, I don't want to read any more about natural gas versus coal, right? Or uh, nuclear fusion versus nuclear fission. I don't, I, don't to, I, I just want to think big. I want to think in terms of big possibilities. And this is a big possibility. Okay, so that's the story on Dyson Spheres. Uh, you know, <laughs> not going to build one next week, but eventually you might do it because it is the, you know, the obvious energy source that's in our neighborhood. Okay. For anybody who's still conscious, maybe we could go to questions, Julia. Um, Dina and Shaila were the ones who were compiling the questions from people. Uh, hi, so um, I'm Dina. So uh, it's actually Shaila and I were doing a project on uh, uh, for a poster session on Dyson spheres and energy consumption. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, we love your work. It's we're so interested in Dyson spheres and we've been doing like astrobiology related things, at least I have for like, maybe like two and a half years now. I've been an art of inquiry for like two and a half years and it's really fascinating. And I'm especially fascinated by Dyson swarms and Dyson spheres because I feel like that's gonna be very, maybe not immediately now realistic, but just in general, because maybe my generation might grow up to be the ones who will start the research. So the first two questions are, how can we build a Dyson sphere slash Dyson swarm today? And what are some of the uses of the energy that we can harness using the Dyson sphere? Okay, everybody hear that? All right, All right. Uh, how can we build it? Well, you know, it's, it's a problem of anything you wanna build in space. It isn't the building in space part, it's getting all the material up into space, right? And, and you know, actually constructing it in space. Sending anything into space these days is very expensive. It's about five to $10,000 per pound, in case you're planning on sending your kid brother into space. Consider that, that's the cost, okay? But, you know, we're still using chemical rockets are filled with kerosene and liquid oxygen and all that. So we don't have the best rocket technology. We will eventually have better ways of getting stuff into space, but, you know, that's a big hindrance to building a Dyson Swarm or Dyson Sphere because it's just very expensive to get the material up there. Now, a better scheme right away, 
and I'm sure eight of you have already thought of it, is, well, don't send up a bunch of junk, you know, steel or iron ore or whatever you're going to use uh, from Earth because it just costs too much. Just, you know, go mine an asteroid. Or better yet, if you were to take one of the larger asteroids, you know, the kind that could wipe out dinosaurs or anything like that, you know, how big are they? Well, they're about the size of a, a city, right? They, they might be five or eight miles across. Right? You, could, you could probably put it in the backyard of a Texas rancher or something, but it isn't that huge. It isn't that huge. It's not 100 miles across. So if you were to take apart one of those asteroids, you know, turn it into thin stuff, well, yes, you could make quadrillions because there's all sorts of valuable stuff in asteroids. I don't know how many of you have taken a, an asteroid apart recently, but if you were to do it, you would think, find things like platinum and, you know, there's a lot of stuff. But in this case, all you want is material that allows you to build, you know, these, these things floating around. And that, so the answer is you could do it, but, you know, not inexpensively now. It's still cheaper to build another power plant. Okay. And the second part of your question. Uh, so I think it was, uh, what are some of the uses of energy you can harness using the Dyson Sphere? Well, I mean, you know, almost anything you want to do requires energy, unless it's to sit around and find your center in a Zen situation. I mean, almost anything you do requires energy, right? And if you had a lot of cheap energy, which you could get for one of these things, uh, you could, you know, build a rocket that could go to the stars, for example, if that interests you. So, you know, if you have enough energy that's inexpensive enough, almost anything you want to do now becomes, you know, conceivable from the practical point of view. Um, Actually, I, I heard a talk not too long ago where a guy said Dyson's, his thesis was Dyson spheres should be illegal. Now, depending on which state you live in, maybe they're illegal where you are, maybe they're not. But the reason he said that was not because he was worried people were going to take apart asteroids. It turns out that if you had all that energy, you could, you know, put it into a big radio transmitter or a big super duper laser and incinerate somebody else's planet. Even though they're five or 10 light years away, you know, you, the Dyson sphere would be big enough to essentially build a, a big mirror out of it, aim all that energy at somebody, uh, somebody's planet, you know, uh, people you just don't like for whatever reason, and just bam, poof, away goes the planet. Now, that's not a use that, you know, many people are thinking about, but uh, that's one you, use you you could actually do. If you had enough energy, there, in a way, not much limitation of what you could do. Do you, do you want to incinerate somebody's planet? Maybe the Death Star? I don't know. I just wanted to thank you for speaking here. And the next question actually involves aliens. So do you think that there are alien civilizations that are out there that have built Dyson spheres? And if so, do you think that the Dyson spheres could possibly lead us to the aliens? Well, I think the answers are yes and yes, right? I mean, you know, we like to think of ourselves as being the crown of creation. You know, this is the best nature can do, produce a planet where we have a million different species of things that crawl and fly and, and swim, and also us. And, you know, humans can do things that most animals can't, like writing bad poetry, right? So, uh, in, in fact, <laughs> we, we think very highly of ourselves, and, but do you think we're the only intelligent species in the galaxy or let alone the universe? Well, that would make us very special, right? And, you know, I know you all like to think you're special, but that's because your parents have been telling you that ever since you appeared on the planet. You're probably not so special. <laughs> I don't want to take anything away from anybody. I don't want to cause anybody to lose confidence in themselves, but in the you know, history shows that every time people said something was true because it would make us special, they were wrong. I mean, for most of the history of humanity, we thought we were in the middle of the universe, right? <laughs> the earth was the center of the universe. Now, you know, that isn't true, but it was very comforting to think you were in the one spot that was the middle. Of so if we think we're special, either biologically or special, uh, intellectually, that doesn't make much sense either. The universe has been around three times as long as the Earth has, right? The Big Bang was about 13 and a half billion years ago, for those of you who still remember that. And, you know, 
uh, that's a lot longer than the Earth has been around. That's three times longer than the Earth has been around. So uh, I'm sure that, you know, most of the stars you see at night are, are much older than the Earth, uh, the sun, I should say. So I think they're out there. And your idea of let's find the aliens by looking for Dyson seers is a good one, right? That's actually been tried. Because if you have a Dyson sphere, you know, you've got the sun in the middle and, you know, all those solar cells on the inside. But the, the, the structure itself is still a little bit warm, right? Maybe as warm as the, you know, the floor in your house there. It's not terribly warm, but a little bit warm. And that produces infrared light that you could see. And uh, so people have looked for infrared sources in the universe that might be Dyson swarms or Dyson spheres that somebody else has built. It's a good way to find aliens, I think, but we haven't found them yet. Okay, uh, so that'd be, I think, number five and number six. So, uh, oh, okay. How long will it take us to build the Dyson Swarm? Uh, when do we plan to start? Like, who's gonna fund it? And also, how could we detect? <laughs> Nobody's proposing that we build it. Right. It's like, you know, when are we going to colonize Mars? Right. That kind of thing. I mean, eventually we will, but nobody knows when it's going to start, except maybe Elon Musk, who claims, you know, within a couple of years, there will be humans living on Mars, enjoying the good life on the planet Mars. Uh, Dyson spheres, nobody is proposing to build that yet. But you don't have to. That's a, one of the beauties of the Dyson sphere idea is that you don't have to build the whole thing. Right. Uh, like, I mean, you know, when it comes to a car. If you just build, you know, the tires or maybe the ashtray, right, it's not very useful to you. You have to build the whole thing before it gets useful. But with a Dyson swarm, you don't have to build the whole thing. You just build part of it and you're already getting energy, right? You just scale it up. So I think that probably, I mean, it's just a total guess, but that uh, within 10 or 15 years, there will be serious proposals to build uh, something like a Dyson swarm, starting with something very simple. Just some, a, a satellite that orbits the Earth and has lots of solar cells on it. And that's, that's not so hard to do. But, you know, it's not that we, it's not like, you know, living to be a thousand years old. We don't know how to do that yet. But this is something we know how to do. It's just a question of whether it's economically interesting. There was, there was more to this. I think the question was, what was the, maybe I should look it up. Yeah. Could we detect an alien species, an alien Dyson sphere? Well, as I mentioned, yes, you, you could in principle, but that it hasn't happened so far. The problem is that you're looking for something that puts out a lot of uh, infrared. OK, but it turns out there's a lot of dust in space. Right. And dust also puts out infrared. So it's, it's a little tricky. It's like trying to find lions in the forest if lions look like trees or something. <laughs> It'd be hard to find the lions. They were, by the way, the, 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 re, the way that current searches were made is people just went through catalogs of things found by infrared sensing telescopes to see if anything uh, showed up in those catalogs that couldn't be explained. And you know the answer to that is, well, there are a lot of nifty things in those catalogs, but it's very hard to determine whether they're really Dyson spheres. I think Dina and Shyla are fighting it out over. Uh, okay, so I, I think, uh, Shyla, do you want to do the next two questions? Yeah, you? I am. Yeah. A lot of these are like repeated questions, though. So um, uh, the next, there's like a couple of questions regarding the cost of a Dyson Sphere and how much it would be to like build it now or like even like just, for example, putting up like one solar panel in space. How expensive do you think that would be? And also how, when do you think it would be like, it would start to pay us back? Like it'll be expensive to put the first few up, but then we'll also not have to pay for our energy. So like, when do you think it's gonna be like a net net balance and we're actually gonna be get benefits from it? Well, I, I, that's really a good question. I think that it will become competitive as they like to say uh, with conventional energy generation, maybe within 20 years, something like that. That would be my guess. It's not gonna take a thousand years and we're not gonna do it next month. But at, at some point, it does because up there, 
When I say up there, I mean once you get above the atmosphere of the Earth. So, you know, in space, hey, hey, when you get up in space, the amount of energy you get per square meter, square yard is, you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 watts. Now, since each of you uh, is consuming 10,000 watts per day, right? Uh, you know, Elon is consuming 10,000 watts all the time with everything that he's doing and everything his parents are doing, and maybe they even heat up his food for him. You know, that's on average about 10,000 watts. So you need um, roughly, well, 10 to 20 square yards of solar cells to supply that. And if you go to NASA and say, I want to send up this solar array, I mean, which is, you know, 10 square yards of uh, hardware, right? They'll say, well, you know, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Because as I said, it, these days it costs about $5,000 per pound to send stuff into space. So the, if you solve that problem, then maybe you solve this other problem. And one of the best solutions to the expensive cost of sending anything or anybody into space is to forget about chemical rockets where you just burn kerosene, essentially, and make a, 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 it's called a space elevator. And you heard about space elevators? Yeah. Well, you just essentially, it's Jack and the Beanstalk, but without Jack. Right. It's just a beanstalk going up into space. Uh, it's just a, actually just a, a wire, if you will, or a flat wire, a sheet of some material going up uh, about 150 miles straight up. You build it near the equator somewhere. And uh, then you can, you know, step into an elevator at the bottom and go up into space at, you know, 50 miles an hour, whatever. It won't take you very long to, you know, before dinner, you'll be up in space in orbit. And it doesn't really cost much, although you have to listen to bad elevator music on the entire trip. So we don't have that yet, but by 2035, at least some people say, by 2035, you'll have that. And once you have that, then you just send up all the, the material you need for the Dyson Swarm up in the elevator. And instead of it costing you $5,000 per pound, it costs you $5 per pound. And at that point, it becomes much more feasible. Uh, going okay. into space in an elevator. Uh, do we have any good simulations on Dyson Swarm operations and Dyson Swarm building? And do you think we can have Dyson Sphere powered rockets? Okay. If we have any good simulations. Well, Dyson Swarm operations, I mean, probably there's not much you need to do. Once you set it up, it kind of runs itself, right? It sounds like a science fiction movie where you know, the, the, the species is gone, but their machines just keep, you know, chugging along. Uh, you have to repair things, right? If you want more energy, you have to build new things. You have to have some batteries maybe on the ground, although it's not clear, but uh, have batteries on the ground to store the energy. So, you know, the, you can get to it anytime you want. All these things will require people as well. And besides, if you don't have any people, what's the point of building the thing? I mean, right? If, if people aren't, getting more fun out of life because they got more cheap energy. Why bother? But, you know, the sun keeps burning without much attention from us. The number of people who have a job that reads responsible for sun maintenance, you know, there aren't many people like that because you really don't have to do anything. Nature's doing it for you. And the same with the Dyson uh, swarms because, yeah, you got a lot of areas of solar cells, but they don't really burn out very often, right? They're, they're very reliable. They're all solid state. There are no moving parts. So yeah, you'd have some people, you know, governing it. I think the, the thing you'd really want to have is some people who negotiate who gets the energy, but you know, that's not really directly related to the technology. Any of you running on Dyson Swarm technology yet? I wish. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I was wondering how long it would take to possibly like use up a, the sun, if that's even possible, or like use up enough of the sun that it actually makes a difference to like our planet. Well, here's the thing: the sun doesn't really care what you what you do with its energy. At least it hasn't, you know, written any letters of complaint. So if you have a, uh, you know, the Earth already intercepts about. One, two billionth, I think it is. One, two billionth of the energy of the sun. But the sun never sends us any bills for that. 
uh, or anything. It just, you know, falls on the backyard, you know, causes the plants to grow and heats up the bunnies or whatever it does. So, you know, the sun, however, is eventually going to change. In fact, it's changing all the time. Uh, you may not have noticed it, but the sun today is somewhat brighter than it was yesterday. And it's slowly heating up and that will slowly heat up the earth. But you won't really notice the difference for at least 100 million years. And you may notice, oh gosh, temperatures are going up. Temperatures are going up now, but not because the sun is running out of energy or somehow is getting brighter, which is actually what's happening. It is getting brighter. But we know it's going to happen to the sun because that was one of the big questions of astronomy for most of astronomy's existence. How do the stars work? And you know, it's only been like 140 years since people said, and smart people said, well, the sun must be a giant ball of coal, right? Now it turns out that wasn't right, but, <laughs> and the first thing that proved it wasn't right was some guy who worked out, well, how long is it gonna be before it burns out, right? The coal is all gone. And it turned out that that wasn't very long, a few thousand years. And they already knew that the sun was older than that. So, but the sun is slowly brightening. It sounds odd because running out of fuel and it gets hotter and bigger and brighter. And the answer is, yep, it does. But eventually, eventually that will end. And the sun has maybe another couple of billion years in which we could still have a planet with life here. So I don't know if you're worried about what's going to happen to uh, your, <laughs> your successors. You know, they've got a few, few billion years to go before it becomes critical that the sun is running out of energy. And by that point, presumably, we can just all hop in a rocket and go to somebody else's star system. I don't even know if that answered the question because I don't remember the question, but you know, it, it, you don't have to worry about that sort of thing. Like, when do you think a Dyson swarm will be a necessity for us to survive? Yeah, well, you know, you don't really run out of energy sources on Earth. It's just that they've become more and more expensive, particularly if you're using them at a, you know, at a higher rate. I mean, it's sort of like saying, well, when do we run out of gold? Gold's, you know, fairly rare in the Earth. Uh, the Earth's crust, you know, in the dirt, the ground outside the back window. Uh, and, but so when do we run out of gold? It isn't that somebody finally uh, takes out the last gram of gold from the Earth and says, well, that's it, folks, no more gold. I mean, it doesn't happen. It's just that it becomes harder and harder to get much gold out of. And so the price keeps going up until the point where you say, no more gold. We're not going to use that anymore. From now on, all wedding rings have to be made out, you know, I don't know, yttrium or, or just iron or something it's that's iron. still cheap. Okay. So you don't run out but of, of energy, but it is getting, you know, it, it gets more expensive. And it just ask the people to pay the uh, electricity bill or the gas bill in wherever you're living. And it just keeps going up. Okay. So at some point, and this was mentioned before by one of the people here on this call, uh, it, it becomes competitive to say, all right, forget the, you know, the power plant down the street here. We're just going to build a, a bunch of uh, solar panels, put them into orbit around the Earth, or around the sun, and, uh, you know, take the energy that way. I mean, one of the questions nobody's asked, but it might occur to you. All right, so you got all these big solar panels out there in, in space orbiting around, sailing around the solar system. But how do you get that energy back to Earth? Right. So, you know, you can't have the solar panels up there just connected to a big extension cord it goes back down to the earth, that, that isn't gonna work. So, you know, people have thought about that and you, you beam the energy down using a microwave transmitter basically, right? So there are ways to do that anyhow. But the question was, so, you know, when does that become competitive? And uh, my guess is within 20 years, but I have been wrong on many things, almost all things in the past. So that's just my take on it. Okay, hey, I think next Sasha T had a question. Yeah, my um, yeah, my question was so if solar uh, so if solar panels, um, so what do we use to receive the uh, light energy being com and com and coming from the Dyson sphere? For example, solar panels could be used, but I don't think they're super efficient. I just also wanted to ask, wouldn't it be real? And if we jump in and light energy, like let it go down to the earth and then capture it there. Wouldn't it be uh, like the, wouldn't it be a huge amount of energy? It would be a huge amount of energy. So wouldn't it be very hard to deal with? Well, yeah, th that's a legitimate question. As I say, the people who are thinking about this, and it's been a long time since they 
first started thinking about this. This idea is quite old. But they said, okay, look, you've got this big solar panel in space and it's producing all this electrical energy, but how do you get it back to the people who need it in downtown Cleveland? And they would say, well, you know, just hook it up to a really powerful microwave transmitter, you know, essentially a radar transmitter yes. and aim that radar beam, if you will, down to the earth where you have big antennas to collect the energy and feed them into the grid, into the grid. Okay. And, you know, that, that would work. The only thing is people ask, well, wait a minute, you're talking about, you know, maybe tens of trillions of watts being sent down to the earth and collected by essentially radio antennas on the earth and then sent into the grid. But all that energy, I mean, what about a bird that, that flies through that beam, right? What about animals that crawl through the beam? Are you going to have, you know, sandwich meats all over the desert where these, these antennas are? I mean, it's, it's, isn't it going to cook everything? And it would cook some of them, except that if you spread out this beam, so it's, you know, 10 miles on a side, something like that, then the energy at any particular spot isn't too bad. It isn't so much that you'll cook everything that's alive in that area in New Mexico or wherever you put this thing. Okay. So people thought about that and that, that works. You know, you just send it down in a, essentially a low energy beam, right? And then you can collect it with really big antennas and uh, you got all the energy you can possibly eat without cooking your dinner by the beam. And also, why would why would we use solar panels? They're not super efficient, but they're not super efficient. But I don't think there are too many other ways. Well, it's true. Solar panels that we build today are, I mean, the best of them are about twenty percent efficient. Twenty twenty-five. Right? I'm sorry, is that wrong? No, no. I said I said twenty twenty-five ish. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's say it's twenty percent efficient. In other words, all this energy falling on your solar panel only 20% of it gets turned into usable electricity. You say, well, that's a waste. But, you know, how efficient is your car? I don't know how many of you own sports cars. I figure most of you do. Well, you put in gasoline, and if you could get the most energy out of that gasoline as is in it, you know, burning it, uh, it's only like 20% efficient because, you know, the, the, the device that you're using, the uh, gasoline engine, you know, it gets hot. And obviously, that's all wasted energy, right? And you're spinning the tires around. The, the tires have, you know, some flexure as they move down the road. So you're losing energy there. The bearings are all less than perfect. So you lose energy there. Then you hit a phone pole. You lose a lot of energy there. So, I mean, none of it is 100% efficient. But it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. I mean, if the solar panel is only 20% efficient, I mean, how else could you get that solar energy? Right. Yeah, if, I it, even if, if it's it, only twenty percent, it's still quite a bit. Yeah, that's a lot. Twenty percent of a large number is still a large number, right? And in fact, there are other ways in the deserts here, just to the east of California, and the Nevada desert. When you're flying, you know, into San Francisco, I've seen this often. You see these giant you know, <laughs> fields of mirrors. They're just ordinary mirrors, right? Oh yeah, mirror farms, and they use um, the mirrors to heat up molten salt. Those ones? Yeah. Yep. What they do is they, you know, collect all that uh, sun energy and that makes the thing at the focus very, very hot. So they essentially boil salt, if you will. And then, you know, with that, they can turn turbines and so forth and so on. That's all a little complicated to put into space because now you've got moving parts and things like that. So you want it to be really, really simple. You just want it to take as much energy as it can, even if it is only 10 or 20 percent efficient and turn that into a microwave beam and send that down. And, uh, you know, once you've done that, you've basically solved the problem. OK, thank you, Sasha. I think uh, we should probably move on to the next person. I know that we all have a lot of questions, but yeah. there are a lot of people also waiting to ask questions. So I think next we have Shri. Sorry if I said your name wrong. No, you said it right. Um, I wanted to ask um, you, what do you think the next threat is from space the earth might face like threat meaning wiping it out or changing its current conditions in any way well i don't know if you're an optimist or a pessimist uh obviously sooner or later you know uh, an asteroid is going to hit the earth again i mean it's been hit by lots of asteroids and it you know it could take us out the way it took out the dinos um 
But that was a pretty big rock that took out the dinos. And by the way, it wasn't just the dinosaurs who suffered. Three quarters of all species were wiped out. So, you know, fairly serious. That would probably make the headlines in tonight's you know, newscast. Uh, but those rocks, which, as I say, are about five miles across, something like that, uh, are pretty rare. There are a lot more small asteroids than there are big ones, obviously. And the big ones only hit ones that are, say, the size of the one that did in the dinos. They only hit about once every 100 million years. Now, obviously, it would be a bummer if the next big one hit while you're you know, walking home from school or something. But the chances of that happening are not great. Still, a rock like that could wipe out all humans. And, you know, so and it, it turns out that your gravestone could be marked with, here is Rodney, wiped out by an asteroid. The chances of that happening are greater than the chances that your tombstone will read, here is Rodney, wiped out in a plane crash. I mean, people get killed by plane crashes, but you don't, you know, you don't lose 7 billion of them with one plane. So that's why these two things are kind of equivalent. But the next big threat from space, there's obviously the rocks in space. You've heard about that plenty. Uh, the other thing is that we could pass through a, a what's called an interstellar cloud of dust, you know, big clouds. Of, if, you, if you look carefully at the Milky Way, you know, in a dark spot so you can really see it, you'll see some dark areas in the Milky Way. That's just dust, interstellar dust. It's, it's a part of the Milky Way where there's uh, about the same amount of dust, you know, per cubic yard, if you will, as, uh, well, as almost nothing. I mean, it's only going to be a couple of molecules of dust. It's not many, but space is big, really big. So, you know, these things amount to something and they actually, we could actually be sailing through one of them as the sun moves around the galaxy. And if it happened, it might reduce the, intensity of sunlight by a few percent, right? We would just be going through this fog of dust. And if you reduce the sunlight by, you know, 5% or 10%, that would wipe out so much of the food chain that, you know, it isn't a matter of uh, reverting to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because, you know, you won't have the peanut butter because the peanut plants all die. So that's a threat from space, if you like. And then there's always the possibility that aliens will come to Earth and flatten Los Angeles just because they're mad at something. Uh, you know, I live in Northern California and I don't mind if they flatten Los Angeles, to be perfectly honest, but, you know, I don't know if that's a likely thing to happen or not. Most likely it's not likely. Still awake? Okay. Uh, thank you, that was a really good question. Uh, now moving on to Quinn. All right, so I don't think anyone's asked this yet, but um, it obviously costs a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of money to build a uh, humongous structure around the sun or, or even around Earth, whatever you're building it around to harness the sun's energy. But um, what happens if we screw up? What happens if something goes wrong and, uh-oh, it's collapsing, it's falling into the sun? Because we've wasted a ton of money. Uh, we've sent materials into space that are now wasted. Um, so what would we do if something goes wrong? We the structure fails, something collapses, or we run into a problem. What would we do? Because yeah. at that point, so much money would be wasted. Well, like, how would we fix that? Yeah, well, that's true. I, I think it would make good stories for the magazines. But you know, I mean, we waste money all the time, so maybe that is. But the, the nice thing about a Dyson Swarm is it's hard to imagine it all going wrong, right? You know, uh, when I was young, there were certain brands of automobiles that were called lemons because they, did, <laughs> they didn't work very well, right? They, they would fail easily and so forth. Uh, but that, that, you know, one of them was, well, it was called a Nash Rambler. My, my roommate had one. And it was considered a lemon, you know, don't buy that. It's going to cause you all sorts of trouble. You'll be bringing it into the shop all the time. And it's true that they, they did go into the shop more often than a Chevrolet did or something. But not all of them failed, right? Some of them failed. So the advantage of the Dyson Swarm is that it's hard for it all to fail because they're individual things in orbit, right? 
And maybe this one fails because it crashes into another one and you lost two panels. But if you've launched 100,000 of them, you don't worry too much about that failure rate. So it, it's, it's, it's not something where if one part fails, the whole thing is useless. It's not like your computer, your laptop, right? If one chip in your laptop fails, you can make the whole thing useless. Right? But that's, that's not kind of quite the, the situation here. I just wanted to um, do uh, ask one kind of follow up to that, though. Um, so uh, the, in the movie Gravity, they have satellites um, uh, right orbiting Earth. Something uh, the, the the space shuttle that they go up in is damaged. That causes more um, space debris to then cause kind of a chain reaction. That's exponential right. growth of the amount of space debris. So you could have one thing go down or out of or orbit or go haywire, and then a bunch of different things that are doing it. Like for if we have a Dyson swarm, are they close enough to, or uh, the, the diff different orbiting bodies close enough to cause the chain reaction like that? Well, uh, you know, it depends on the specifics. Uh, that scenario that you described, Glenn, is known as the Kessler syndrome, because there's a guy, Donald Kessler, who worked for NASA. Uh, I think, I think I, I'm not sure he was maybe in Texas or Alabama. Anyhow, it was a, it was a guy that pointed this out, that exactly what you say, it's an exponential process. You know, two, two rocks happen to crash into one another, and now they produce 100 new rocks. They're smaller, but, you know, and the rate of collisions goes up the more things you have to collide. So it becomes exponential, it becomes a serious problem, and eventually you have sand all around the Earth, making it difficult to send anybody to Mars, because their rocket ship would get sanded down to a toothpick by all that debris. But in the case of the Dyson Swarm, you know, you could make it very thinly populated. It's, it's just like uh, the asteroid belt. Uh, anybody who's watched any sci-fi, either, uh, you know, on television or in the movies, you know, whenever they go through the asteroid belt, they, they show you this scene where giant rocks are flying by the camera and they're trying to navigate through it and so forth and so on. Now, if you actually went out to the asteroid belt, Right. If your school arranged a field trip to the asteroid belt next week, you would they put you down on one asteroid. You would have a hard time even seeing the next asteroid over. And if you could see it, it would look like a little dot. You know, they're typically separated. I mean, the big ones are separated by millions of miles. So they don't, you know, you know, hit one another very often. Now, the same would be true of a Dyson swarm. You could make it farther away from the sun and reduce the uh, the proximity one to the other. So I don't know that that kind of thing is a problem. I think the, the, maybe a more serious problem would be that the solar cells have maybe a 50-year lifetime. Who knows, right? And so after 50 years, your, your entire power structure is beginning to fail. That might be something. Uh, okay, so let's see. So someone asked if Hypothetically, could it be possible to recreate spacecrafts from movies like Star Wars or Guardians of the Galaxy with the extra power from the Dyson Swarm slash sphere? And also, do we risk wiping out aliens by inter intercepting and using the sun's energy before it gets to Mars? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know why they would go to Mars. I mean, you know, there aren't great restaurants. Probably going to be the Earth because we've got more to offer. But, but uh, yeah, you could power spacecraft to the stars if you had that much energy. And the big problem with sending a rocket to the stars, right, is energy. It really is. I, our fastest rockets go about 10 miles a second, okay? Not an hour, 10 miles a second. That's pretty fast, and that would get you to, uh, you know, Pluto and, you know, like, 10 years, a little less. But Pluto actually isn't very far compared to the stars. They're tens of thousands of times farther away than Pluto is. So if you took a NASA rocket and decided you're going to go to the next star over, which is called Proxima Centauri, which has, by the way, at least two planets, I believe, um, you know, that would take you 10,000 years one way. All right. And that's longer than you want to sit in a middle seat eating peanuts or whatever, right? So you want a much faster rocket. And if you had more energy, 
you could you could do this much faster. And you might say, yeah, yeah, you got all this energy, but it's down here on the ground. It's flowing through all these wires here. How do we get it to the rocket? And the answer is you could send it back up to the rocket the same way it got down to Earth, you know, on a microwave radio beam or just a big super duper laser, aim it at the rocket. And the rocket has, you know, sort of uh, the outside is coated with aluminum or silver or something that reflects light. And it turns out that that laser hitting that reflecting surface will push it along, right? I mean, you don't normally think of light as having pressure, but it does, it does. It's very weak. That's why, you know, your desk lamp doesn't blow everything on your desk off to the floor. But in fact, it is exerting pressure there. So you could do that. And so if you had enough energy, if you had enough energy, you could speed that rocket up to almost any speed you want. I mean, you run into other problems like relativity, you know, the, the people on the rocket won't age as long, uh, as quickly as the people back on Earth. Uh, that might be a problem if you come back to Earth and you're still 26 and everybody on Earth that you knew has long ago died. You know, that might be a bummer. But you could certainly use that energy to go to the stars. Uh, so hopefully we might be able to use some of this information in uh, our research, in our project. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I say we really appreciate your time. And you're probably by far one of the funniest lecturers we've had come here. And it was a lot of fun to host this webinar. And yeah, if anyone has additional questions or comments, feel free to say them now. Otherwise, I feel like we can conclude this webinar. And thank you so much for coming, everybody. Yep. Thank you so much for explaining <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to much. us and coming and answering all of our questions. Well, I, I, I enjoy it, even though I wouldn't want to listen to myself. But fortunately, I, I don't have to. I just tune myself out. It was great. I hope we can do it again sometime. We would really yeah. love it. Yes. We have yes, lots definitely. of questions. Thank you. Yeah, we literally spent hours just asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry yeah. the answers are so long, but. No, no, I think that's fine because I feel like the um, because questions are like one of the most important parts of learning, especially in our like, I know that I don't know if the majority of us are homeschooled or not, but I feel like in education in general, asking questions is important. Yes, and they're it just is. As important. Yeah. Yeah, and the school is called Art of Inquiry, so it's kind of like yeah. the art of asking questions. So yeah. it's very fit for all the people who yeah. go here. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been great. It's been great. Yeah, it's great. Thank, Thank you, you all. So